of the people. What is the city but the people? I love that line. Good evening, I'm Jesse Berger, founder and artistic director of Red Bull Theater. Thank you for joining us tonight. I hope this finds you and yours all safe and healthy. Thank you for joining us for this remarkable conversation. These informal conversations investigate approaches to essential passages from the Shakespearean and Jacobean canon and beyond with some of the finest actors working in classical theater today. Next Monday at 7.30, we will continue our Red Bull Theater Live series of online readings, reuniting members of the original companies of some of our previous off-Broadway productions with Shakespeare's Coriolanus, directed by Michael Sexton. All of us at Red Bull are very grateful to be able to offer these new ways to share experiences with our community of artists and theater lovers during this challenging time. Tonight, we're especially grateful to the incredibly talented Dion Johnstone and Lisa Harrow for being our guests. These two terrific actors starred in our 2016 production of Coriolanus, and they will be reprising their roles for next Monday's reading. I hope you enjoy tonight's conversation. We're all looking forward to your feedback, which you can email to us at feedback at redbulltheater.com. And now I'm pleased to introduce you to your host, Nathan Winkelstein. Hi, Jesse. Thank you for that introduction. One of the things to get you on this program. <laughs> Thank you. You think anyone would be interested? Well, we'll find out. You can say you in the Facebook comments if you would be interested in having Jesse chat. And uh, yeah. have a good today, uh, um, we will talk soon. Okay. Bye. Um, thank you all for joining us for this remarkable conversation. I am your host, Nathan Winkelstein. Thank you for joining us on Facebook, on YouTube, and on the Red Bull website. This is a special two-parter conversation, so it's gonna be a little longer, but it's totally worth it, so stick around. Um, these programs have been put together to help provide some insight into how some of the ablest minds in classical theaters go about their work. It's an informal, free-form discussion that we hope will show the depth, specificity, and passion that these theater craftsmen bring every day. And this two-parter is about Coriolanus, and we begin with a speech that happens about midway through the play. It is said by the titular character of the play, Coriolanus, right after he has been banished from Rome. It is most famous for its final line, a line that in today's world, I think we can all perhaps sympathize with, there is a world elsewhere. This monologue that he gives upon his banishment represents the nadir of a precipitous fall for Coriolanus. A couple of scenes before, he has returned to Rome as a great military conqueror after defeating the Volscians to defend Rome. And due to that has been asked to become a consul by the senators, which he proceeds to almost do before the people and the tribunes of the people turn on him and dismiss him from the consulship, which Coriolanus does not take very well. And in his, um, tendency to not close his mouth and honestly gets himself in trouble with the people, which eventually leads to his battle, which provokes this speech. Chris's inability to compromise on his worldview, one instilled at an early age by his mother, Volumnia, is both his greatest strength and his greatest weakness. It is on full display in this speech. Coriolanus lashes out at Rome and at the Roman citizenry for not being, for not living up to the values that he perceives to be most essential to Rome, honor, bravery, etc. And for him to show the, the pain, the, what, how this hurts him, as well as what Rome means to him in this speech requires a great uh, expertise in this character's entire journey. And so this monologue is in many ways a keystone to Chris as a character and a, a valid one to discuss today. And there is no one better to discuss it with than my first guest, who is a star of both Canadian theater and the US. He has appeared on Broadway. And of course, most importantly, appeared on Off-Broadway, Red Bull Theater, as Coriolanus in our 2016 production of Coriolanus is, of course, 
Dion Johnstone. We charge you of contrived from Rome, all season to office, and to wind yourself into a power tyrannical, for which you are a traitor. How? Traitor? Traitor? The fire runs in the lowest hell, fall in the people. Call me their traitor? Thou injurious tribune. Within thine eyes sat twenty thousand deaths. In thy hands clutched as many millions. In thy lying tongue both numbers, I would say, thou liest unto thee with a heart as free as I do pray the gods. Mark you this, people. You need not put matter to his charge. What you have seen him do and heard him speak, so criminal and in such capital kind, deserves the extremest death. But since he hath served well for Rome, no. I'll know no further. Let them pronounce the steep Tarpeian death, vagabond exile, flaying, pent to linger but with a grain a day. I would not buy their mercy at the price of one fair word. There's no more to be said, but he is banished. As enemy to the people and his country, it shall be so. You common cry of curs, whose breath I hate as reek of the common fens, whose loves I prize as the dead carcasses of unburied men that do corrupt my air, I banish you. And here remain with your uncertainty. Let every feeble rumor shake your hearts. <laughs> your armies, with nodding of their plumes, fan you into despair. Have the power still to banish your defenders till at length your ignorance deliver you as most abated captives to some nation which won you without blows. Despising for you the city, thus I turn my back. There is a world elsewhere. Thank you, Dion. Oh, pleasure. Um, I love jumping in like that. I, I haven't yet experienced having to do it myself, which was horrifying, but I love jumping <laughs> in like that. That was really, really great. Thank you. And thank you for joining today. It really, it, I really do appreciate you, you coming on the program. Oh, amen. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Yeah. So um, let's just to have a double program here. Let's Let's jump right in. I mean, this... There's so much. There's so much passion and visceralness to this character. Um, and you, you, I remember watching your performance, just being played by you, in this. And um, I, you've talked a lot about the the ideals that Coriolanus has been raised to um, emulate versus the reality of the world around him and how he struggles with that. And I wonder if you could speak a little bit to to that and to how it in some ways culminates in this speech. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think he's been raised uh, from birth by his mother, largely, large, uh, to, be, uh, to be the epitome of a perfect soldier, the epitome of, of, epitome of a Roman citizen who dedicates their life, their soul, their actions, all to the ideal and the glory of, of Rome. And I think where he uh, lacks skill is uh, being political, is, is existing in the, the political realm where you can't always say what you, what you feel. You have to learn to compromise because you're working with different factions to, to get what you, what you want. And, and that's something in, in, uh, in, in wartime is a different kind of life than, than it is um, operating in politics and in, in peacetime. And, and that's a, a big challenge for him. He also believes that people should only be rewarded for what they have achieved, what they have done. People shouldn't be given um, responsibilities or rights or, or anything that they haven't gone out and, and earned um, or, or properly deserved. So in his mind, the idea of giving the populace uh, political sway is, is, uh, is ridiculous. Um, he speaks in the play of... of um, 
of the common people who were enlisted to to fight. First of all, they had to be forced to, to go and fight to the war. They, they wouldn't do it willingly. And on the battlefield, when they were sieging the gates of, of Coriolis, they, they, they wouldn't, they, because they wouldn't threat the gates, they wouldn't hold the siege. And these kind of people uh, are not deserving of honor. And so this is a period in, in Roman history where, where the, 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 the common people were really fighting to have a political voice. And so the tribunes were created to, to, to be their voice in the Senate. And this is something that he greatly fears and, and warns the, the, the senators and, and the, the, the noble class is that these people are gonna come into our halls, they're gonna take over our way of life. They're going to do with it as, as they will. And they are not people who know how to rule or even can be ruled as we can, as we can see. And in this scene, um, after being forced to go against what he believes, being forced to go back to the people and and um, you know say what they want to hear and win their support and what their voices, he finds himself entrapped by them, put on trial, and banished. Um, I think the whole idea for a, a, a general like him and a and a real hero uh, in terms of of the, the building and the stability of, of Rome, to lose your citizenship like that um, is, is, is something that, that uh, unfathomable to him. I think deeply hurtful to him. Um, but then there's the question of you, you, you can so easily banish your, your, these rights that you have with this veto power that you have, you can, you can banish a, uh, a defender. So then what are you gonna do the next time that Rome is attacked? How are you going to protect you? that if you want these rights so much what are you going to do to to protect yourself i would love to see that so it seems to me i mean what you're describing it it i, I think is a um archetype that we recognize this this great soldier who is is good at that thing and believes in the honor and built around soldiership um and when he strays he gets into trouble mm -hmm. um and it's actually a theme we see in, in other Shakespeare plays, including, for example, Macbeth, when he strays from being a soldier to, um, well, being a murderer in his case, which Coriolanus never goes to, but also stumbles when going outside of his strength. What is it? Is Coriolanus aware of these strengths and weaknesses? And if so, what is the motivation he has to ever pursue the consulship, which sort of precipitates this fall, is his his entering into the political sphere, a sphere that, as you say, he's not particularly accomplished at. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think on on one level, I, I look at Coriolanus as um, a study of arrested development, in in a sense. I think he's got this ideal of of who a man is, who a leader is. And from a very young age, he was able to fill the shell of that. But I think throughout this play, uh, he's a man who's searching for his identity. He's searching for what is my own real voice? Because um, to pursue this, this consulship, where on one level he feels that's the natural evolution, so that's something that I should have. Um, but what he doesn't understand is, is the whole notion of compromise, where you can't just have it. You can't just say what you feel. And I think that's difficult for me. This is what I was always taught. Why are you telling me now that this isn't the way to, to go about it? And, and I think it's that part of his manhood that he never fully grew into, even though he has the shape of this warrior and, and he's like a killing machine. Um, he still hasn't really found um, what it is that makes a, a, a complete human being, a complete man. And, uh, and it takes... Um, ironically enough, his his mother and, and wife and, and son making a, an appeal for him at, at the very end of, of the play that he's able to, um, uh, I mean, it's, it's heartbreaking because on, on one level, uh, he finds that love with, within, and I think it's through love that he finds the, the, the fullness of, of himself and he's able to make a balance. Okay, I'm going to seek for compromise here and I'm not going to storm Rome, I'm not going to kill my family, I'm not, you know, but that, that, uh, forces him to compromise the, the the deal that he's made with with the Vulcans, and and he has to lose his honor in order to find himself. And uh, it's tragic because that that means he loses his life in life in the process. Um, so yeah, so I mean that that particular moment is actually interesting, and I'm going to want to uh, come back to that. 
later when when we get to that speech, because I do think the idea of like, is this his great victory or his great tragedy or both mm -hmm. when he is moved by his mother is a fact. Um, at this point in the play, he's obviously has not gotten there yet. He hasn't evolved yet mm -hmm. to that point. And have, I would imagine by Coriolanus's standards, gone against your sort of clock by going in front of the people and showing your wounds and all of that stuff. And do you think, does that in any way by this particular monologue, the fact that you actually did in your mind bend so far in the wind to them and it slammed back and hit you in the face with it and you're back to being like, I'm going to tell you exactly what I mean, is mm -hmm. that, it, I guess, is this speech a, a victory or a defeat? This the um, there is a world else. I think at this point for him, it's 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 a defeat. Um, he has been undermined by the people. He has had his citizenship stripped from him, stripped from him. and they have the power to I mean, take his life should he seek to contest that. And I think that's uh, it's it's humiliating, especially after having made the attempt, you know, as, 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 as badly as he, as he pulled it off, but he made the attempt to appeal to the people and to get their voices. They gave him the vote and, and then it was overturned. And he was told, well, you didn't do it properly. You have to, you have to, you know, submit to them. You have to tell them you're their warrior. You have to show them you you have to do this, whether you like it or not, just get it done. And, and in order to really appease his mother, um, because he, he he can't take her her scorn or, or her disapproval of him. He says, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll do it against his will. He will force himself to do it. But then to be cornered in this kangaroo court, and the whole thing has been set up, and to be in a situation where his mentors, the nobility of Rome, they don't have the power to do anything about it. So they can only sit and allow this happen. I think it's like a, a double betrayal for him. In that moment, so I think he's reacting out of, of of anger, out of spite, out of hurt, out of shock, out of shock of all of those things in it, and and then also a, a real threat, you know, you know, uh, for him to say, you know, I'm I'm not the one who's banished here, you're the one who's banished. Reminds me of those people who say, um, you know, I'm not in jail with you, you're in jail with me, you know, be. Right. Warm, you know, be um, I think it's, a, it's it's meant to scare the people to get them to think about what is going to happen because in fact he then goes to to Romanes, to to the Volscians he joins them and, and says you can either kill me if you want or better yet use me as your weapon against Rome because I'm prepared to to lay waste to 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 the city and so it's a it's a real threat to to get the people to uh, really think about what's going to happen now that they've that they've done this. So when. Just to, to pull the string backwards a little bit for the people out there, for the actors who who wonder, like, how do we come to these decisions? How do we come to the, because obviously you've thought a lot about this guy through the rehearsal process and through everything else. Mm -hmm. When when looking at, I, and I realize it's hard to isolate a speech from an entire character, so you can answer this however it makes the most sense to you. But when looking at this speech, mm -hmm. what is it you do to... Um, how do you approach it in, in in terms of fitting it in? You know, it, it's interesting because even just technically in, in, in the language, I, I noticed that the first part of it, you common cry of Kurds. And it's got a big apostrophe. Whose breath I hate. Even just saying those words, I, I, I noticed there's a lot of um, consonants, and a lot of plosives, and it's very, it's very cutting to it. Um, all the way up to, I banish you. Um, the, the be and the banish, common cry, curse. It's very aggressive and it's very angry and it's very um, violent in, in, in the energy that it, that it generates, you know, until he gets to the, I banish you. And then I think it feels to me like a bit of a, an afterthought. And you know what? And here remain, you know, in, in your inconstancy or in your, uh, I can't remember the word right, right now. Um, but then from there, the language starts to get more, um, there's more vowel sounds and it's less percussive. And that leads me to think, you know, let every feeble rumor shake your hearts. 
your enemies with nodding of their plumes fan you into despair. It, it leads me, uh, you know, to, to feel that there's a, a part of them that's trying to conjure, trying to, uh, you know, frighten them with with conjuring this this spirit of 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 the malice that's that now hangs over them because of this. And and so I think as he's working his way through that, he's he's using those 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 qualities. And I think for me that that allows it to build from there. So it comes in explosive, like basically the like, fuck you. You know, you don't banish me, I banish you. And you know what? You know what? You just sit here and you and you remain with this, you know? In fact, and then he just goes into this slow bill, you know. So that was kind of my approach technically into how to play with the, the, the emotions and play with how I wanted to affect the, the citizens and, and in turn the, the audience. It's to me hearing you describe that and hearing you describe the language and cues you in. Because it does seem to some extent like he is, he has all these splits. You're saying he lashes out. Hmm. Then actually philosophizes is probably too strong. For it. The solution from rage to what does this mean? Mm -hmm. The fact that that's shown in the language, as you discuss with the vowels, is fascinating because, of course, he does have to get to what the end of this. they're considered before that there's a world that is the idea that he that the itself teaches journey is is one is there any particular that you where do you think he starts clocking that maybe banishment maybe there is another place. do you think he even believes it well i certainly don't think that's ever entered his mind until that moment until the moment that he speaks i think it's uh, almost um a realization of, of what potential there might now be out there because this Rome, as the way that he knew it to be, has revealed itself to not be that. And if Rome is not that ideal, then then he doesn't want a part of it. And there's a better world out there and I'm gonna want to find it. So when one is banished, that doesn't mean that their life is over and that there's no future for them. I'm gonna go and make an even better future than was ever possible in this Rome, if this is what you tell me Rome is. And and I think a, a, a clue for me to that is, is him saying despising for you, the city. I don't think he ever despised Rome before, but they have now created a, a situation that because of them, he now hates Rome. It's a lie. And so I think that leads him to the realization and the hope that there's gonna be something better out there and I'm gonna find it. I don't, I don't need this. Now, how much he believes it, I think on one level it's, it's to save face a little bit too, to, to not walk out the, the, um, the dejected person, to, to, to walk out with his, with his pride. So, so there's, um, there's a little bit of that in it as well too. And it was interesting what you said. You said that he just, I guess, in this, that, is a lot or well I guess I would like a little bit more explanation about what or a little bit more into what you mean by that in terms of what Coriolanus's idea of Rome is versus the reality and do you think that there is another place that can be what you've been taught Rome is or do you think that the whole concept is a lie That's very interesting. Like the, the concept of a, of a city having an ideal, being anything that's achievable, or is it all bullshit? Um, I just find it interesting because from here, he goes to Antium and, and he thinks about all of the bloodshed that he's caused to that country. And he begins to take in Antium and take in the Volscians in a, in a, in a new light. Um, um, not to see them just as, as enemies. Aphidius, who has been his mortal enemy, I think at, at this point in, in, the, in the play, begins to look to him as the only other noble person out there. The only person who had never compromised, never been anything other than who they are, 
on the battlefield and, and he knows that world of the battlefield and to him that's a world that's true war makes sense this political stuff doesn't make sense um so whether he knows and i don't think he knows at that moment that he's going to go to antium and he's going to raise an army and, and and come back i think that's uh, i mean this is all just happening in in the moment but um but i do believe that for him he he he, he comes to believe that Aphidius is is the only other possibly the only other truth that's out there so if if there is a world um that can hold itself up to the ideals of what he thought Rome was trying to be what Rome was then possibly hopefully he'll find it in in Antium with the with the Vulcans and and if that's not possible he's prepared to uh to die because if that's not possible then what is there and there's no honor in the world well it is interesting it's interesting what you're saying i hadn't really thought about it because there's this fame that famous line of coriolanus in the latter part of the play where he has turned from man to dragon mm -hmm. and from from human to beast could be one way that that's being described and if this is this idea of this is the structure he was built to believe in and if that structure does not exist, what does and is being noble and honorable even of worth? I mean, I, I don't know. I, I don't want to. Very. That's very. That's very actually interesting. I, I hadn't thought of it in, in, in terms of that. Um, but he does become um, more animal as he as he goes back into his warrior side and combined with with the Aphidius, he begins to achieve. Um, in the eyes of of Vulcans, this godlike status. He's almost appearing like Mars, the god of war himself, and, and they really, really take to him. And 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 perhaps there's something for him in this world of, of battle and of violence that is pure and and has an, an ideal that's very basic and mm -hmm. um, very true. Um, but then, because then you're contrasting war with, with love. His, his mother comes and the appeal that she makes and, and his wife and, and, and son are, are to remember your heart, remember, remember the people who love you and the people that, that you love. And to betray that is, um, is an unforgivable crime to one's soul, let alone your legacy that will be left in time to come. And, and, and that begins to crack through that warrior spirit in him and and he eventually concedes to it so i think there may be something in in just the i i think it's in the purity of the relationship with with the Phidias, but that's a relationship that's always been based in battle and based in, in 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 war that for him he feels you can't lie funny thing is um it's very simplistic and the Phidias isn't like that and doesn't hold those same ideals and he sees that that Coriolanus does, and, and sees that that's Coriolanus's flaw is he can't he can't compromise, and so Aphidius is behind the scenes as he's watching Coriolanus rise in power and 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 um, and hold such sway over over Aphidius's people over the Volscians. Uh, he begins to work behind the scenes to try to find a way to get that power back because it's as if he's been eclipsed by by Coriolanus. So and that's something that Coriolanus doesn't see coming. I think when Ophidius turns on him, that's uh, that's a, that's a huge, that's a, that's a huge thing. And it's is that that he would have thought? Is that because you because Ophidius is seen as sort of a, a a soulmate? So just as you couldn't imagine yourself ever doing such a thing, you have a blind spot of Ophidius doing such a thing. Like I'm not sure you would have been surprised right. if one of the tribunes did this to you. Right. But, but Ophidius. Projected onto Aphidius the ideal of himself. Yeah. And so to have that kind of manipulation, to have that kind of behind the scenes, you know, uh, machinations is the same kind of politics that, that were happening in Rome. And it's just such a, a, a shock to him. At that point, he's just like, well, then kill me. Kill me. Come after me. Rip me to shreds. Cut me to pieces. And do you think, what, oh boy, we're, we're, we're jumping ahead, but that's the point of the conversation, the point of the conversation that goes where it goes. So the, the kill you at the end, well, one has to ask out of this conversation is, is it, 
disappointment in the world? I mean, you go through a whole big roller coaster there at the end be between, and we're going to talk more about this, finding love or having your honor broken or both by Volumnia. There'll be a, more about that soon. Mm -hmm. um, or is there also in that this idea that this last great bastion of this can be my world? These, this honorable man, Ophidius, this man who's just like me, who proves it works, has proven he's not that, and like, there's nothing left in this world, so kill me. Is it, it, it never occurred to me that that was part of it, that the disappointment of what Ophidius has done might actually lead to you saying that, and I don't want to put it on you, but was that part of it for you? Yeah, for, for me, there was also a feeling of the kind of ideals I mean, one has to question wh whether whether these ideals are are realistic. You know, you have an ideal of of what society is is meant. You have an ideal of of how government is supposed to 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 operate. But in the end, is it a hundred percent achievable? And Coriolanus is a, is a person who's taken it by rote that it's the truth. It's the way. It's the only way that it that it works. And anything less than that is dishonorable. And he doesn't have time for. And, but he's living in a world that's changing and, and evolving. He's living in a world where, like it or not, um, more people are, are, are getting power and, and authority and are getting a voice. And in order to survive in this world, you have to find a way of contending with that. And so I feel, in a way, he is, he has modeled himself like the heroes of, of, of the Golden Age. Like Achilles, of you know, um, and that time of those kind of heroes is passing. And I think Ophidius is an example of a of a, of a new kind of hero, a person who can be just as as violent, aggressive, a great leader in in battle, but is also very politic, and and can you know get things to pass, make things happen. Um, and so the realization that he's been betrayed in that way by Ophidius and what his actions are looked at, I think he knows on some level that, that his actions may not go well with the Vulcans because he has compromised himself by cutting this deal. I think he didn't think it would come from, he hoped at the very least that it wouldn't come from, from Ophidius. That just hasn't been their, their relationship. But the, the realization of that and the realization that this is who Aphidius is. I do think that, what, what, what else is there? I, I think for Coriolanus, I can't be that. That's not, I can't, I can't be that. So here's my stand. Right. Take me out of, if that's what it's, it's gonna be, I will fight with my, my last breath. But I, if this is the world, I can't be a part of this. So I think, Part of the tragedy is, is, is what's needed in the world. It's like a world that no longer needs those kind of heroes and doesn't have a place for them. Um, almost, and this is one thing that our director, Michael Saxon, brought up with me and, and I explored a bit, was the idea of, of a soldier coming home from war and the PTSD that they may experience and how ill-equipped um, our world certainly has been, it's getting better, but there's still a long way to go to, to deal with that, to really help these people who have seen uh, just a different kind of life and coming back into society and, and just the way society works doesn't make sense. Just the simplicity of, of everything, the, 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 the social media and all of the, the meaningless things that, that people are engaged in and seem so important when the life that he has known is, you know, if you fail in your task, your fellow soldier beside you dies. It's life or death. And, and you are relying on each other to, to be true to your word, to your orders, to the task. And it's as simple as that. So I, I have to ask, um, it's been interesting listening through this. You, you've used the word to describe both yourself and Ophidius. You used, um, well, Coriolanus. You're too much Coriolanus in my head to describe both Coriolanus and Ophidius. You've used um, uh, the word hero. Mm -hmm. You've used the word. You've used the word tragic. Mm -hmm. um, and and of course with the with the PTSD, um, which is something that I, I 
have also seen very much in this character. I'm prone to seeing it because both of my brothers are military, but um, mm -hmm. the, which I think is a very real thing, just the difference between peacetime civilized society and war and the black and whiteness of one and the grays of the other is very difficult on characters. Mm -hmm. I, I have to ask, and I realize you probably have a biased opinion, but what what would you describe Coriolanus as? I mean, he's one of the most ambiguous, he's one of the hardest characters to me to box in the canon, because he's not a hero, he's not quite a tragic, like he's not quite a tragic hero. He's not, he's certainly not a villain. He's, it, or does he change from one to the other? How did, what, did, did Michael talk about that at all? I, yeah, we did, we did talk um, a, a lot about that. And I would say that, that he, he is a, a tragic hero. And I would say that his, his flaw um, is his inability to compromise, his inflexibility. Certainly what he can do in battle and what he's done for the establishment of Rome is, uh, I mean, everybody would say, even, even the tribunes, even the people who don't like him, would, would say you gotta have it to him. I mean, the guy is a war hero, but he has such disregard for the people. He's got no time for them and he's very open with it. And you know, once he gets started, you, you can't stop him. <laughs> you know, you can say, well, that's, 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 I mean, the, the, the nobles go, well, that's, you know, that's the way he is, but you gotta consider what he's, what he's done. And when he speaks like this, he's speaking like a, like a soldier. But the problem is, we're in a time where the people need their voice. They need to be heard. They can't be brushed off like that. And, and it's Coriolanus's inability to, to meet that, to take that seriously, to really take it on, that I think leads to, to all the problems. Now, in another way, it's, it's, it's also a bit of a, a, a tragedy of not knowing yourself. If he knew himself well enough and felt that he had the empowerment to say, no, I don't want to go for console. He says at one point, you know, when Volumnia is, is going, I just got, I got one more wish for you and then all my hopes are, are, are made. And he's like, I know what it is, but I just want you to know, I want to serve in my way. I, I, I don't want to sway with them in, in, in theirs. And if he was able to hold to that, um, he may have had more success. Or if he was able to recognize, I'm, I, I just, I can't do this. So put someone else forward as, as consul. I'm not meant to do this. Put me back on the field. That's where I have my great success. He could have gone on being the war hero for, for Rome and, and this wouldn't have happened. But because he didn't feel he had the power to, to, to take that, he's a man who I think is, is on one level, he's, uh, he's never got to live the life that other people could. He was put in the wars like right away. He had to become this. So it's sort of like not necessarily the life that he would have chosen for himself, but he does know what he's good at. And um, if he could have stuck with that, it may have been a very, very different outcome. Well, that was, uh, I, I think that that's a, a really um, good culmination point for us to move forward to the next part. Because I think, as you said, you brought up in this very much that there is a massive aspect of Coriolanus that we have sort of danced around so far because we've known that we're, we're moving forward towards it, which is this, he is this unbelievable example of a man's man, both in all of the toxic ways of that and, and many, of the, well, many of the positive ways. Um, with the exception of his quite extreme relationship to his mother. Yes. And yeah. And so we, of course, that it is no secret that our second guest tonight is uh, the wonderful Lisa Harrow, who played Volumnia in our production. And we will uh, move forward into that section to have both of you discuss this relationship a little bit. Um, the scene for, for everyone who is watching, the scene that you're about to hear and that we will move into a specific discussion of in just a few moments happens, we've danced around it already. It's the scene where Volumnia, along with Coriolanus's wife and son, come out of Rome and go to Coriolanus's camp now that he's leading the Volscians to plead 
for Rome. And it is a, I, it's one of the great speeches of, uh, it's just every single tactic and every button that can be pushed and every lever that can be pulled gets pulled by this mother trying to defend the city, um, her, her city. And it requires an actor of absolutely extraordinary acumen and an actor of quite a bit of while their cells. And so Lisa Harrow was, of course, the perfect person for us to get. And we were very fortunate to have her in our 2016 production of Coriolanus. And I am very excited to add her to the conversation now. Lisa, it's a pleasure. Hi. <laughs> ah, there you are. Good. <laughs> I have sat for more. Nay, go not from us thus. If it was so that our request did tend to save the Romans, thereby to destroy the Volsces whom you serve, you might condemn us as poisonous of your honour. No. Our suit is that you reconcile them, while the Volsces may say this... Sorry, this mercy we have showed, the Romans this we received, and each on either side give the all hail to thee and cry, be blessed for making up this peace. Thou knowest, great son, the end of war is uncertain, but this certain, that. If thou conquer Rome, the benefit which thou shalt thereby reap is such a name whose repetition will be dogged with curses, whose chronicle thus writ, the man was noble but with his last attempt he wiped it out, destroyed his country, and his name remains to the ensuing age abhorred. Why dost not speak? Thinkst thou it honourable for a noble man still to remember wrongs? Daughter, speak you. He cares not for your weeping. Oh, speak thou, boy. Perhaps thy childness will move him more than can our reasons. There is no man in the world more bound to his mother. Yet her he lets me prate like one of the stocks. Thou hast never in thy life showed thy dear mother any courtesy when she, poor hen, fond of no second brood, hath clacked thee to the wars and safely home, laden with honour. Say my requests unjust and spurn me back, but if it be not so, thou art not honest, and the gods will plague thee that thou restrain'st from me the duty which to a mother's part belongs. He turns away. Down, ladies, let us shame him with our knees. To his surname Coriolanus longs more pride than pity to our prayers. Down, an end. This is the last. So, we will home to Rome and die among our neighbors. Hey, the holes. Boy, who cannot tell what he would have, but kneels and holds up hands for fellowship, does reason our petition with more strength than thou hast to deny it. <sighs> Come. Let us go. <laughs> this fellow had a volsian to his mother. 
His wife is in Coriolis, and his child, like him, by chance. Yet, give us our dispatch. I am hushed until our city be afire, and then I'll speak a little. Wow. wow sorry it took me a little while to turn my video on because <laughs> sorry <laughs> no it was amazing such... Thank you. god now that i have a grandson in my real life uh. that little boy your son carolina's son and her grandson what a weapon and what a fragility to present to a father who is betraying everything that she's brought him up to believe. It's just, it's, it, I, <laughs> sorry, I'll get over it. Yes. It's, a very, it's a very extraordinary piece of writing on Mr. Shakespeare's part. Yeah, yeah. And it's a beautiful and crazy conundrum, you know. Yeah. How, how can... How can a man authorize the slaying of his mother, of his wife, of his child, of his family, of the people that he loves? Yeah. How, how, how can one do that? But also, if honor is prized more than anything else, and, and honor to the glory of Rome is the highest level of, of, of achievement and, and pursuit, how can one throw away their honor? in order to save their family. So and, yeah, and how can she betray everything that she's brought him up to believe? Um, you know, the main, the main thrust, she says, you are my warrior, I hope to frame thee. And now you're ripping out the bowels of our country. So that's all beside the point. And if you're really going to be honorable, you need to make peace with the enemy and save our lives. I mean, She's actually asking him to completely turn his back on everything she's raised him to be. I mean, it's her tragedy as well as wow. Coriolis's, I think, because the last thing she ever imagined was that her action would lead to his death. Mm -hmm. On that note, um, I would like to bring on one of our guests tonight who actually had a question about this transformation really that Volumnia has to go through and she can word it much better than me, which is why she is um, joining us. And uh, Wendy, I'm gonna be bringing you on to join us in just a moment to ask. Hi. Hi. So I I was just, uh, it was wonderful to um, hear Dion and, and Nathan talking about the political end of the play, which is so absorbing and fascinating. But your speech, Lisa, brings me to what I always feel with this play, which is there are these seething emotional undercurrents. And I guess my question for Dion is, how does Coriolanus feel about his mother? Really, what is going on there? And in her final plea, where, as you say, she betrays what she's brought him up to believe, what, what convinces him? Is he persuaded by what she says? Is it his love for her? I'm fascinated by their relationship and you guys must have explored it in rehearsal. Thank yeah. you, Wendy. I think for, for Coriolanus, um, the relationship that he has with his mother is, is it's a combination of, of love-hate. He absolutely loves her. She has made him who he is helped him achieve the career that, that, uh, that he has. All of his successes, he would, he would say that he, he owes to her insistence, to her help, her making sure that he met the right people through his life. It, I mean, we talked about it as a, as a great project, uh, a mother-son project. Yeah. Um, and, and so I think there's, there's great profound love there. Um, I think it's love-hate because she knows exactly how to push his buttons. She knows exactly how to, to undermine him at the same time. 
and and bend him to her will. And and I think on some level those are those are the areas when when he feels like he doesn't have power over his life, and and uh, and and that's upsetting. Um, so I think in the end he's he he really is moved by 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 love. She, she's really able to 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 reach him and, and get him to really ask himself. I have a wife here. I have a child here. I have my mother here. Am I actually prepared to let them die? Because this is the cause. You can't have it. You can't have it both ways. And and he can't. He can't let that happen. Who would he be at the end of this if he allowed that to happen? But that, of course, means that he's going to go back on on his word and and uh, and in doing so. Um, betray the, the the man that that they have worked together to to build him to to be the interesting thing about the mother son is where's the father there's no mention of the father mm -hmm. and um and it's unusual because you know the tradition is in a military world anyway it's the father who raises the son to be to follow in the father's footsteps mm -hmm. but there's no even there's not an historical reference to a father um, but it's clear in the beginning of the play that the, 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 the fact that he's become a hero and has conquered Rome, I mean, co conquered the Volsces and saved Rome and, and he's the, the great man of the moment. And of course, there's all the, the, all the patricians in the town say, right, now he's going to be a, he's going to be a consul and be one of the rulers. Mm -hmm. And that's good for her. She loves that. She's very, very powerful in her argument to make him actually bite his tongue speak to the people, do what he needs to do so he can be a consul. There's such ambition for him there. And, um, and then at the end, at the end of the play, she says, you know, I I'm going to, I'm going to commit, I'm, rather than be burned by you guys coming into Rome, I'm going to commit suicide. So you will walk over your dead mother's body to get, I mean, she uses such powerful emotional language, which is the complete flip of this, what she's, that scene she's done earlier in the play when she's persuading Coriolanus to stand for a consul and show his wounds to the people and become a servant of the people. And she just says, you know, just do it because that's what, that's the honorable thing. So it's interesting to watch her playing with the concepts of honor and how honor to, is actually the best honorable move is to, is to let the Volsies forgive, you know, pardon us and we will accept the pardon and everybody will go home and it'll all be lovely and everyone will be happy again. That's honourable. Otherwise, it's not honourable because your name will be mud, which of course it would be, but of course there'll be no one left in Rome <laughs> to see that your name is mud. But it's the, it, I found it's d doing it that the actual thing for the mother of having raised this creature that's become this monster mm -hmm. that you still love and this creature who's going to actually she knows how he will destroy rome and she knows that it's the end of the city that she's lived her life serving and being part of and loving so she has to open up an emotional heart which i don't think she's used much but as i say it's that little boy too because what kind of a life is he going to have yeah and you know, then his reaction is so wonderful when he just i'll never forget as one of my great moments in my life was you sinking to your knees going oh uh, mother mother i was just going to say because i remember what we explored in that was in this relationship in the in the man that Coriolanus had become he didn't within that have full access to his heart. He had to shut that part down in order to do what needed yes. to be done. Yes. And, and so within the language, you know, that that, that his mother has, has used with them, the, the, the love was of a different kind. It, it wasn't of a, an affectionate kind. I mean, in a way, Volumnia had to be both mother and father and, yes. and feel the discipline in, in him. And so so I, I agree that, that what's different about this argument is that just the amount of time that's spent searing emotionally into his mind, into his brain, and into his heart, what what the cost of this will be, bit by bit, because he he tries to escape and she and, and she won't let him. And it's also happening right in front of his of, of his arch enemy now, major uh, well, an apartment. 
in the war. They're watching how, how you insist on them being there so they can see that you're not going to betray them. Mm -hmm. So your loyalty is to them rather than, I mean, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it's, it's an incredible, I mean, I, I didn't even know who could, who could, who would do this in this world that we live in today, who would have the courage to actually speak and the courage to stand there and listen and try and with, withhold a connection. And that, yeah. that seems to me to be exactly what Dion was talking about earlier about how this is a passing of an age that Coriolanus almost seems to belong to yeah. an age previous to the age he's even in and that he is, in that way he's tragic because there's something about him that we do look up to and admire and go, gosh, look at his passion, look at his commitment, look at his courage, and yet he cannot function in a civilized society in this way. And it, it is, seems to me, I mean, watching you two even interact now, it is in some ways the great tragedy of the play that this amazing scene of love and connection is in some ways so has to come with his destruction as well. Those can't live together. Yeah. That scene in itself is a war. It's a battle of, of many different tactics of, of the heart, I think. Yes. And it's the, it's the biggest battle. It's bigger than, than his battle with the Phidias that you see at the beginning, which is a physical representation of the battle. This is one that's, that's uh, a, 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 a war of the heart. And he's it's also much more tactical than, I mean, a, a physical battle, you know, he, 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 brutality wins. In uh, this, there's a tactical, Thing. There's a tactical, the, the, her, her use of the concepts that are at the very heart of his being. And she takes those and uses them as weapons to draw him back to his humanity. Mm -hmm. I must let, as much as I could continue this particular conversation for another half hour, I must let Dion go. I've already held him over by a few minutes. Dion, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for giving awesome. us your time next week with Corey <laughs> with the actual yeah, meeting. I can't wait. I'm looking yeah. forward. And it's been it's been really really wonderful chatting with you. Thank you. Thank you so so much for okay. joining us. Great working with you again, Lisa. Just oh, so you too, Dion. Can't yeah. wait to see you again next week. Amen. We'll be at Viral. What is it virtually? No, I don't even know what the word is. Yeah. <laughs> Whole new world. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, Dion. Take care. Bye. -bye. Bye. Thank you. Um, well, Lisa, I'm still actually slightly recovering from uh, your speech, um, but I knew um, what I really wanted to talk to you about, and I actually found cleverly, I found somebody to ask it for me, which oh. is great. So, Leo, if you are ready to join the fray and ask your question, it would be great to have you. And here, here is Leo. Hello. Hi, Leo. Uh, hey. Hi, Lisa. Um, that was so moving, I have to tell you. Um, from the tactics you were just talking about, um, yeah. my question is going to be a little tactics to technical um, in a moment. But before I get to it, I just have to say that your performance that you just did reminded me all over again of how much actors have to draw on their own personal experience and what's going on in their lives at the moment. I mean, I've heard actors say that they uh, draw on whatever happened during that day and bring it to the performance if they can in some way. So you're uh, mentioning of being a grandmother and having a grandson uh, and how much that informed your emotion was just very moving to me, it's to the performance. And it, it took me completely away from what my question is. And I'm gonna see if the question can come around to something that's emotional nonetheless. When rehearsing and memorizing, do you scan all or at least some of your speeches? And if so, can you give us an example of a particular passage where scanning really helped you not simply with the rhythm and the dynamics, but most of all, helped you with the feelings that the character is expressing. Is there anything in the process of breaking down the scansion that gave you guides or cues or clues of where to pause, where to, where to dig deeper, if that makes sense? Well, uh, this raises, sorry. This raises a very interesting question because I was trained by at the Royal Shakespeare Company under the auspices of the most wonderful director, John Barton. Mm -hmm. 
who uh, was the creator of the what they call the John Barton tapes in America, and um, it, which is playing Shakespeare. And the thing that when I came to, to live in America and work in America, the thing that st struck me first was that suddenly um, everyone was scanning. We never, when I was working with John, he never scanned the line. But what he talked about was the rhythm of the line. But he also, um, the most important thing he taught us was that the most important word in the line was the last word of the line. And you need to go towards that and land on it, and then it takes you to the next line. Because on that last word lies... The, the 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 meaning of the line it's the most important word because it's 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 partly a technique to, so that an actor doesn't run out of breath because he was very he, he's very concerned about actors running you got to drive the breath through to the end of the line so you don't miss the last word but if you actually strike those last words of the line it becomes like a kind of trampoline a structure that you can you can it, it's exhilarating when you finally are able to speak verse and land on that word and land on that word and it's it it's, helps the the listener the the audience audio listening to actually follow the meaning and the structure of the verse it's not prose it's verse now as far as scanning is good, yes, it's really important to know when a line is regular, because as John used to say, when it goes ba dum ba dum ba dum ba dum ba dum, which is the regular iambic line, you know that there's no emotional thing going on. The, the, the actor, the character is in a regular place. He's totally balanced, uh, normal, and everything is smooth. The moment there's any kind of irregularity, like once more, come to the breach, dear friends, once more, those are all uh, all major stresses. And there's an, an the, so then you've got to say, well, why is that line so incredibly stressed? Well, it's because it's a call to battle. Um, so when, whenever I look, I look to see what are the operative words? And yes, scanching, I learned when I came to America, having been through RADA and the Royal Shakespeare Company and all of that for 31 years, and then suddenly I discovered scansion when I started teaching in American universities and everyone was talking about it, I had to go and study it. Um, so yes, it does help. I mean, it helps you sort out what's the regular line and where the um, and where the stresses come, because when the most important words, the emotional carrying words, the words that... Um, have the energy of the thought. Those are the words that you really hit. Now, I wish I could find one. I mean, well, you know, the word honor. Thinks thou, thinks thou it honorable for a, thinks thou it honorable for a noble man. This, uh, see, you could say, thinks thou it honorable for a noble man, but no, it's, thinks thou it honorable for a noble man, that's a very irregular line. Noble man is who he is, and honorable is what he stands for. So that's why that line is irregular. But you, but but once you understand the language, see, I would to me, there's a very acting is a simple thing. Acting is reacting. That's all it is. It's reacting to something that has happened to you. Or has been said to you. So what's happening to her in this scene is the sun is about to burn Rome and sack it and destroy it and kill everybody. That requires a major response. And so there's a lot of um, stuff in the speech which are key um, stressed words. It's not regular. She can't, it couldn't be regular because there's nothing in her that's regular at this moment. I that's that's um, and I learned all that from John. Yeah. Well, I have to. By the way, Lisa, um, it, you. I may have mentioned this before, but actually, in some ways, I learned it from John and you because, like many other people, I have I have watched those playing Shakespeare. This is a, a Shakespeare duck, by the way. I have watched the <laughs> playing Shakespeare DVDs and read the playing Shakespeare book, and it was incredibly formative to my own they're all available on youtube um well not all of them but most of them there were a couple that we did because it was 11 hours that we shot in 1984 so you can see all your famous actors people who you love um 
in Patrick Stewart, in McKellen, Judy, all these people, is young. We're all smoking. I mean, can you imagine? We're sitting there in this television studio. It's amazing what we did, what we got away with. <laughs> Actually, speaking of that, I'm going to ask a question. It came up much earlier on the Facebook chat. Um, yes. before you were on and it's actually just a lovely it's it's a story so bear with me slightly but um the but i think it bears because you used it a lot in this speech um i and i apologize whoever sent this that i don't know your name uh, i was just able to copy and paste it real quick aha look at this oh there it is um i will read it out loud for people as an undergrad, we were invited to watch RSC's Playing Shakespeare series, and 25 years later, the moment that has stuck with me is your Hermione coming to life opposite Patrick Stewart. You had such a deep impact on me as an actor. I found the clip the other day to remind myself what was so magical, what made me watch only you, even though you had no lines. Your commitment, the power of your physical command, and your ease entering the moment and coming out of it when you smiled through your tears and checked in with your fellow actor. I have since discovered my favorite joy on stage is listening and not speaking. Would you speak a bit about silence in Shakespeare, or if you choose, about what your process is in rehearsal or performance to leave Lisa behind and become someone else? Thank you for the great inspiration that brief moment has been in my understanding of acting. Maria Silverman. Heavens. Well, I mean, that moment when the statue of Hermione is alive, she's alive, but he thinks it's a statue comes to life and he touches her and he says, oh, she is warm. And the thing again that John used to say is that the most powerful lines in Shakespeare are monosyllabic lines. Oh, she is warm. They take the longest time to say because they're so full of emotion and they're so simple. Um, so, I mean, that was a great moment to play and, uh, Patrick and I worked for many years. We did Shylock and Portia together and kinds of things. But um, that's lovely. Thank you. Thank you, Maria, for that. My, um, my process. Um, well, I don't know. Here's, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a classically trained technical actor, and I don't do all that feeling thing before I go on. I'll give you a great example of my process. I was doing Wit, a play about a woman dying of ovarian cancer. I did it. I took over from Judith Light, who took over from Catherine Chalfont in the off-Broadway production that was on in the Union Square Theatre for many years. And it was the first time I worked in the theatre in America, apart from a whole lot of teaching that I used to do with Patrick and people like that. We started a teaching program in American universities in 1976. Um, and so this is a woman. I had to go bald and I was dying of ovarian cancer and I die at the end of the play. And it's an amazing play. And so what I did to prepare to go on was shave my head and go on. And people used to say to me, well, I mean, don't you, you know, you're going to die. I said, no, 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 I'm not going to die. I don't start the play going to die. I have ovarian cancer, but I'm ignoring it. So I, and I'm a professor of, of in, in, the, in, a, in a, a language, John Donne, and I'm much more concerned about the meaning of life and death and um, it, 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 metaphysical things than I am about my own physical so, so no, I'm not going to be um, going around feeling, oh, heavens, I'm dying of cancer. And that happens in the play. That happens in the play. You, you, why play the end of the play before you've even started? And so everything I've always done, and I again, I, I went straight from drama school into the Royal Shakespeare Company. And my big role in, the, in Trevor Nunn's first season in 69 was playing Olivia and Twelfth Night opposite Judy Dench playing Viola. Donald Sinden was Malvolio. It was an amazing cast. Roger Reese was in it. If any of you American people remember Darling Roger. He's playing Curio. And um, I, I I stood in the way. I mean, I was from New Zealand and Drada, and now I'm in the RSC. We go. So I, I, we didn't do any of that. How do you pr to prepare? We did voice and we did text, and that's what we did. And um, so I used to get a lot of my my training in the wing. I mean, people used, Donald used to give me notes, and Judy would give me notes. And, and I learned... Um, as I went in the theater. And I think, um, I think I, I just don't work the way, I mean, I remember doing a lecture at the Pittsburgh Theater playing Clytemnestra some years ago, and everyone was being, you know, surrounding themselves with music and getting ready and stuff. And, and I, I just 
walk onto the stage and I, what's happening? Oh, that's what's happening. So now um, uh, I'm reacting. I walk on, so I, li I leave Lisa behind because that's easy and that's a very nice thing to have to do. Um, I put on the costume, walk on stage and begin the story. And it's what Ralph Richardson used to say, you enter a dream every night at half past seven and then you wake up when the curtain comes down. Oh, well, that's lovely. Now my question feels completely down to earth compared to that. But I would say like for probably everybody watching, they're probably doing the same thing I'm doing, which is going, wait a minute. So you're saying that you can do what you just did with the voluminous people without emotionally prepping. And I think your answer to that is yes. Well, the, I, I, I respond to the text. Right. So could you, for me, the actor's job is simply to illuminate and bring to life what the writer has written. We are nothing without right. I mean, that's my old lady's opinion. But I do remember one story where Lisa did come on to the stage, if I've got time to tell us. I was doing Man and Superman with Peter O'Toole in the West End, playing opposite him. And we have a, a big scene in the, this is Shaw's play, Man and Superman. We have this big scene at the end of, of the first act where they have a dialogue and it's all about men and women. And she's, and Anne Whitfield is very, very bossy with him about, oh, men, you men and nothing. Well, the day of that performance, I was pregnant and the father of my child had left me. So I came in to do Anne Whitfield and I'm playing this Edwardian girl who who gets her man, you know, she said, and I'm playing the woman who's actually not been able to get her man and whose heart has been broken. So, I mean, that's who I am. And I'm playing this other woman who, you know, gets the man. So I have this line to, and I, and of course, Peter's upstage, dead center. I'm downstage sitting on the sofa. Well, and I, so I'm not going to play out. I mean, I'm, look, I'm, he's upstaging me. That's fine. He's Peter O'Toole. Why wouldn't he? And he, and I have this line to him, which is men are like boys there, you know, and, and I spoke and the tears just spurted out of my eyes like torpedoes. And I broke down and I couldn't go on. And I'm in it's the middle of a comedy where she's the, she's the, on top of a form. And what I told it was amazing. He looked at me and with his eyes piercing into me and I'm heaving with sobs thinking I'm going to leave the stage, leave the performance, leave the profession and go and kill myself. <laughs> and he looked at me and he took me with his eyes down stage. He walked straight down to the very, very, very edge of the stage and forced me to look at him. He forced me and he forced me to take care of myself and forced me back into the play. And only when he could see that I had recovered, we then carried on the scene. And and then the other people came on and I was fine and everything. When the curtain hit the deck, he took me in his arms. He said, baby, what's wrong? And, I'm, oh, miserable, and told him, he said, Lisa, you don't need a man. Why would you need a man? Men, forget it. You can do this totally on your own. He was and right. he was right. <laughs> wow, that and is. It was, and, and but that, so that's where the me came in and it was just shut down by an actor reacting. You have to, as an actor, be not in your world and your own mental space and in there. You need to be open to the vitality that's coming to you from your fellow actors and anything that happens whether an actor doesn't come on or whatever goes on you need to respond and and you know the play goes on that's it, what it is it's so fascinating listening to you talk about this lisa because it feels you know sometimes when people talk about the english method and i studied in england and actually felt this a little bit it feels at least for an american who's raised in a certain way of some we almost can't avoid method right and all of that stuff it feels very much like um almost shakespeare is like robotics uh like oh if you just do these these things in this order you're a good actor but what's interesting about and it feels very dry, but then we we run into someone like you, who it, you just said that you don't bring, you don't pre-prep any like emotional journey or anything. You let the words take you. And it's so interesting that what just happened for you was you did the speech and in the midst of the speech, found yourself thinking about your grandson. 
because the words took you there. Whereas I feel like it is sometimes very tempting for us poor Americans to go, oh my God, how am I going to get emotional enough? Oh, I'll channel my grandson um, before we even get going. And so it's, it's just, it's a really, frankly, it's, it's a nice and um, uplifting experience to see that process almost inverted where an open spirit and an open mind that knows how to use the language in a dynamic way can pull up everything that makes you you and all of your experience as is needed for Volumnia, not in any sort of pre-prep artificial way, but just from the truth of the moment. And I just find that really, um, personally, as a, as a craftsman myself, I find that very uplifting. It's not a question, it's not a good host statement by me. Well, you know, it, it's just this language and the Greek. I mean, I, when I was 10 in New Zealand, New Zealand, I decided I was going to write Shakespeare at Stratford on Avon. That's what I was going to do. Now, you know, why did I do that? Well, because language. I've always found words, words are the most extraordinary thing because they carry in them. They're like, they're, they're like the ripple on the water, but underneath there are all these incredible moments of, of, of one's own feelings and thoughts and intelligence and that, that give rise to the words. You cannot speak without knowing where they come from. And again, it's reacting to what you've said before. I mean, not only are you acting, reacting to your fellow actors, but you're also reacting to what you've just said and because your brain is thinking all the time. So I'm, I mean, I, and that's why I can't play theater games. I don't know how to do that. What I do know is how to look at a piece of text and go, oh, thou hast never in thy life showed thy dear mother any courtesy when she, poor hen. I mean, fancy thinking of yourself as a hen, um, f fond of no second brood. She only had the one, just the one, clucked thee to the wars and safely home, loaded with honor, you did it so well. I mean, it's the most beautiful image of what a mother is that. And, but, but it's, I, I don't need to, um, I don't need to uh, know anything except look at that line, the, the poor hen, second brood, just all those double O's. I just, those are the things that, where I find my emotional juice. And in doing that, I guess as a human being, I'm quite open emotionally to that. Um, you know, I do say, when my son was married, I didn't know what to feel. And I said to my sister who was saying, what's the matter with you? I said, well, you know, if I was an actor playing the mother of the bridegroom, I would, if, if I was, that was my role, then I would know what to feel. But for me, Lisa, I just feel I've done my job. He's a wonderful boy. He's marrying the most beautiful girl. And actually, biologically, I may as well just go and die now because I've done my part. Well, thank God I didn't because I now have my beautiful grandchildren. But, you know, it, and that to me was the clearest manifestation of what it is for me to be an actor. It's not me. It's the character. It's the words. Can I, just because I know that I've got a, a, a text person of the highest degree on with me right now, can we? Can I actually use the line you just said just to ask you about a, another aspect of it, which is you, you talked about the hen imagery. Yes. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and guess that, again, this is guessing, this is maybe the American in me, but I'm going to, she certainly never uses it in the play. I'm going to go ahead and guess that Volumnia has never previously described herself openly or probably even thought of herself as a hen. No, but she, but he also knows that his audience will know anyone who's watched a hen clucking around her chickens will know that that's a good mother. Right. I mean, it, 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 that's the other thing with Shakespeare. You have to know the natural world out of which he drew his imagery. And um, I, I mean, I find that, that the most enchanting, I mean, first of all, she says, you've never shown your mother any courtesy. And then why would he, because she's just a poor hen clucking around, not having any, because she didn't have any other children that we know of, but he would come home loaden with honor. That's the, and that was all she wanted. She just, she just, she fussed around him, like ruffling up her feathers and making sure he ate and keeping him warm at night, all of those things. So even though he never said thank you ever, according to this line, um, but it's, it, come, it comes with such a broken mother's heart, this line. I mean, why else would you 
call yourself a hen clucking around a chicken unless you see yourself as this very domestic, very basic expression of the love of a mother. There's nothing highfalutin or human or grandiose about it. It's a beautiful image of a simple, natural world in oh, which cool. mothers take care of their children. And that's why it's very emotional, because of the imagery. Yeah, and I, I would say, I mean, people who think that Shakespearean characters speak in imagery because it's Shakespeare, as opposed to being humans who are actually saying real things. Uh, yeah. But I do have a question from one other person that we have on. Yeah. I'm gonna jump on and ask you one as, we, as we're starting to wind down here. Um, and uh, Fleece, I'm gonna be inviting you on. Hi. Hi, hi, hi Fleece. Um, so first of all, thank you so much for your beautiful performance and also for sharing so so freely about your process as an actor. It's, it's beautiful to hear. Um, my question is about uh, Valumni's relationship with her son and specifically about um, the the motivation behind her sort of almost incessant desire to control and to sort of, um, to leave her imprint on on his actions. Um, is it is it coming from a place of intense maternal love, like you were just talking about, where she knows that her son is a gifted military hero and she wants to see him, you know, sort of make Rome as great as it can be because he has such a natural gift? Or on the other hand, is is her own ego kind of entwined with that, where she is almost maybe vicariously living through him in some way. Um, as a woman, of course, she could never achieve what he has, even though she, she may have equal you know, capability to do so. So I'm, I'm just kind of curious if that was a line that you walked as you were preparing and if, you know, what kind of your thoughts on that? Well, it's everything. I mean, that's again, the, the wonderful thing of Shakespeare. Um, it, it, no character is just one thing or the other because human beings are neither one thing nor the other. We, I mean, it, all his plays. I remember when we did um, the, the Merchant of Venice and everyone said, oh, my word, you know, that, that's, you've made it such a sad play. I mean, he, he, John, John had this ability to really go deeply into, um, into all of his plays and, and unveil the complexity. So, for, and in terms of answering your question, yes, uh, everything you propose is, I think, part of their relationship. Now, the interesting thing about this particular production of Coriolanus was that I had to rationalize to myself why I had um, Dion as a son who is different in brown, black, brown skin, black skin, whatever it is. I'm white, and our son was played by a young girl. Um, and his and his wife was was beautiful. She Rebecca. She was a lovely African American actress. So, but I had to. And so what I decided we're in the modern world, I Volumnia in a very ambitious woman, without a husband, completely and utterly unmarried, wanted a son to carry out my vision of myself. So I went to a six. I went to a sperm bank, and I searched for the most warrior. The most successful genetic pool that I could find that would produce for me the ultimate warrior. And that's who I got, my Coriolanus, and he was brilliant. And I, too, I, and I, I shaped him exactly that, following my path for my ambition for myself, which was frustrated. And uh, so I made him this great warrior and this marvelous, heroic, honorable man with no compromise, none. He was resolute and terrific. And, um, and then the tragedy is, at the end, that that lack of wisdom uh, of hers was to make it so absolute without any um, softening at the edges and any humanity. And so at the end, when he's ripped apart, she died. I mean, she's, it's the end of her because her dream you know it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't as as rich and as 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 um varied as it should have been she left out the humanities she left out shakespeare there'd have been no shakespeare in his education no um on that note lisa i have one other question that just kind of catches right on to this and this will be our last thing for the evening you've answered some of it but i actually think there's one particular part that's interesting coriolanus at the end of this speech 
um, says, believe it, oh, believe it, most dangerously you have with him prevailed, if not most mortal to him, speaking about himself. Yeah. Right? He seems to understand in this moment that he will mm -hmm. die for this. Does Volumnia, and if so, when, does she know it before she even starts? Does she realize it? I after? heard it right then when he said it. When he said it, I heard it. And that was in the performance was an arrow to my heart, but I knew that was the cost. I hadn't thought about it until that moment. Got it. I had thought that he would be raised as a hero for being, for bringing peace. Right. But he took it one step further and I heard that. And that's why in the production, we were all left stage and I stayed sitting on the stage and watching as not watching, but being a present in his assassination. Well, Lisa, on that on that incredibly depressing note, <laughs> we, um, we, <laughs> we that is all the time we have. Thank you so so much for joining me tonight and for joining Dion tonight. It was such a fascinating conversation having you both on and both of you. Really, I can't wait to have you both next week. For all of you watching, please do check out this very production of Coriolanus. We're doing a reading of it next Monday at seven thirty with Dion, with Lisa, with Patrick Page, Stephen Spinella, a whole cast. Oh, all those wonderful people. It'll be so lovely to see them again. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you again, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you. And we'll do that rehearsal soon. <laughs> yes, good. Um, and um, for all of you who were watching, thank you all. I hope you enjoyed the program. If you did enjoy the program, please do like this, share it. It's a great way for us to get the word out there. And if you are capable, and only if you are, please do consider making a donation to Red Bull Theater to help us support, to help support us during this difficult time. There is no donation too large or too small. It can be $50, it can be $20, it can be $1 million. It can be whatever you wish. Um, or it can be the virtual version of a hug, which is just a, a like on Facebook. All of it is appreciated. Um, we will not be back in two weeks because it is a holiday, but the Podversations will be back in June with Patrick Page discussing Yago, so keep an eye out for that. Um, if you have feedback on tonight's program, please do email us at feedback at redbulltheater.com. Um, if you have positive feedback on it, please just leave it in the chat. If it's negative, go ahead and send it via that email. And we will, once again, this is the Remarkable Podversations. I'm your host, Nathan Winkelstein. And we end with Meninius. I say to you, as I was said to, away. <laughs>